On today's show, it's the first Pacers position free agency preview. Looking at point guards, you might think the Pacers don't need a point guard. They might not, but I have some interesting arguments for you. We'll look at the best players available, realistic fits, the Pacers outlook at the position. It's all coming today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today it's the first full week of June, and we're diving in to free agency position by position today's point guards. Later this week, we'll do shooting guards with Tyler Smith. Next week, we'll do small forwards and power forwards with guests on each and then centers at the end. Point guards and centers, I'm going to do alone because less intrigue there. (laughs) Pacers have a lot of depth at those spots. It's a little simpler. A lot more discussion to be had about the wing spots, the forward spots, whatever you want to say. And I think there's some intrigue at at the one and the five, but less so, significantly less so, if I do say so myself. And we'll start with the ones today. Uh, thank you all for listening to the shows last week. Very good um, content, I thought. People seem to really like it. And this week, we'll be doing some draft profiles as well. Jarris Walker coming and Anthony Black. Next week, we'll get to Taylor Hendricks. It's all coming. But any whoms, today, let's dive in to the point guard spots. And I'll actually start by saying... The Pacers need fours more than anything. If you want to read about the Pacers shifting up their team, wrote a story about it on Pacers SI with Rick Carlisle talking about what the Pacers sort of need uh, at his end of season presser. He said, everybody wants a four man that has length that can guard multiple positions. And I think that those parts at the end, players that can guard a multiple position, shoot threes and make plays. Yes, that applies to the four, which the Pacers need the most, but it's something I would sort of apply to every position for the Pacers in their free agency outlook. That was a good segue, I thought, because, yeah, of course, they need forwards more. But if you could do that stuff, you can kind of play anywhere. So looking at the Pacers point guard outlook, right? This is the position. I made a little fake depth chart for this exercise where they have the most guys. They have tied for the most guys, I guess, with the five. But uh, Halliburton's going to play a bunch of minutes every game, 32 to 36, whatever number you want to put in there. He's going to be playing a lot. He's going to have the ball a lot. And TJ McConnell is going to back him up or Andrew Nemhard's going to back him up, or Nemhard's going to start somewhere else and then back him up, and McConnell will fill in the gaps. They have very capable ones, right? Those guys are good. They play the Pacers' style. They're young and growing in two of their cases, or in McConnell's case, excellent for many other reasons, right? They are not stacked, but they they have good depth at this position. There's no veteran they need to go get. It's not like they don't need youth. Both of the the other two guys are 23 years old that aren't TJ McConnell. Like, They're really set long-term and short-term at the one, right? It's not like if you'd go out and look at the free agency market, you'd say, oh, they could just squeeze in a young guy. And we'll kind of talk about that at the end, but it's not like that would be even super valuable to them. It's not like a super sage vet would be valuable to them. Although, again, we'll talk about one of those guys too, because, again, there's a lot of arguments coming that you won't see. But in general, the one and the five, they're very set. So what kind of point guards could they want? Guys that don't just play the one would be my answer, right? If you are a one that can guard a two or a three or way up in one of the guys' cases we'll get to when we talk about potential signings, one of these guys is six foot nine. I use Spotrack's positions for this exercise, so I don't talk about the same players in multiple episodes. Um, But if you're a one who can play other positions, that's going to be of value to the Pacers. Look at Andrew Nemhard last year. Yeah, he's a one, I think. His best position's a one. But he provided a lot of value to the Pacers because he could play the two and the three (laughs) and squeeze into a number of lineups because he could play off the ball and on the ball and he could guard perimeter players that wasn't just limited to point guards. So even as you look at what the Pacers have next season in their backcourt rotation, if it's a lot of the same guys, they'll be relying a lot on Aaron E. Smith and Andrew Nimhart again. And they were both healthy this past season, but let's say they're not this season. And, you know, maybe Matherin doesn't take quite the step forward. Like they're going to need defense at the backcourt spots pretty badly. Right. They, they did last year too. And they've talked about improving their defense. They've talked about adding size that could come in any spot. So that would be somewhere that if a player is a, if you were not watching on YouTube and you're just listening, I'm putting up air quotes point guard, but they happen to be large enough to 
defend wings, or they can capably defend wings even if they're not huge, or they can shoot really well to a way that you can put them off the ball, then they suddenly become a 1-2 or a 1-2-3, and that that would have value to the Pacers. This is a guy I think the Pacers should sign, but this is a former Pacer, so I'll use him as an example. Aaron Holiday. If you've been keeping up with him and the Atlanta Hawks at all, he's still really short, but he is was basically a wing for the Hawks this past season. Like he played off the ball a lot. Trey Young and DeJounte Murray handled the ball for that team, but he could be a pest on defense. Even the guys way taller than him, he could shoot it well enough from three. He knocked down 40% and he was basically a glorified wing for the Atlanta Hawks. He had his career low assists per game for Atlanta, but was still valuable because he could shoot and defend. So yes, he's six feet tall. He's not someone the Pacers should be pursuing for this exact assignment, but that is the kind of thing I would describe as a player who, does make sense for them who you'd consider an air quotes point guard because Aaron Holiday, yeah, he's a one probably. He can play the one. He can run the offense. The Pacers have seen that up close. They drafted him, but he also has transitioned to more of a wingy role because he can defend wings and because he can play off ball as a shooter. And that's where this becomes an interesting exercise for the Pacers. And I feel like this will sound redundant because there's a lot of other positions where this will be the case for the Pacers, where if you can defend or shoot, Pacers are like, yes, we're in because that's kind of what they would need. And they have good shooting. I think they're going to be a good shooting team next year. They were this past season, but you can have too much in the modern NBA. That's evident in the playoffs. It's evident in the finals. And that's evident as these wing stoppers become all the more valuable in the postseason. But so does size, right? So even beyond just being like the Aaron Holiday type, even if you're just large and maybe you aren't as good as Aaron Holiday at those things, that could still have value for the Pacers. They were routinely playing six foot five players at the three this past season. They were very small. Heck, sometimes that even was at the four because those were the best lineups they could throw out in many situations. Even adding a guard that's large and and can give you some size or give you some rebounding, I think that would have value to the Pacers, even if that player is a point guard. I keep putting that in air quotes because that player could be a point guard in the past or could be a point guard at times, but maybe for the Pacers, they'd be better suited doing what Andrew Nemhard did and kind of switching from position to position to position and doing stuff. I'm describing a very niche sort of grouping of players, and most of the free agent point guards, I'll even admit, are not that, right? If you just wanted to to say, do the Pacers need a point guard? Should they be pursuing point guards this summer? I would say absolutely not. Like the traditional sense of who you'd want as a point guard running your franchise, Pacers have one. They have one of the best ones in the league on their team already in Tyrese Halliburton, and they have good backups. This is not somewhere they should be chasing someone aggressively or using significant resources. Despite having cap space and draft picks, I think very few of those resources should go towards a one, maybe on like a two-way deal or something, just in case the worst happens, like it did two seasons ago with injuries. But they don't really need depth at the spot. But if they can get someone creative who can do way more than just the traditional scope of being a one – or can provide them a little something extra and be more wingy or size or something, that is where I think the Pacers can extract some value out of this position in free agency, even though that might be a little weird and not something fans would expect the Pacers to do. Because to close, I've talked about this a lot. Of course, this player is hard to get, but sure, the Pacers need wings the most. They need defending and rebounding the most this free agency. That's the stuff they should be pursuing. But I've talked about this a lot. Some a, a, a little subtle other thing is, They don't have anybody who can shoot pass dribble. And those are really hard to get players. They're really talented, but Halberton's amazing at it. When he comes out, they don't have anyone who can do it as well. So teams can slow them down a lot easier. That's why their offense cratered so much without Tyrese Halberton. If they could get another good fitting player who can do all those things, I think that would have value too, even if they stink as a defender, just for the occasional moment that they could help. So let's talk about the best players available at the point guard position this summer. Do any of them make sense for the Pacers? And if not, We'll pivot to all of the realistic targets or the people that fit the descriptions I just gave, whether that's size, defending, being able to play up on the wing, whatever that is, because handling wing defense and size, hey, the Pacers will use that even if the player is typically a point guard. Before we get into all that, though, I want to talk to you guys about Prize Picks Daily Fantasy Made Easy. Prize Picks is doing a $1 million daily super flex promotion during this NBA Finals. Every day of the Finals, one Prize Picks user will get a chance becoming a millionaire you place an entry on their site after 8 a.m eastern one randomly selected entry will have a chance at the million 
if you do uh, the the super flex picks and you get all six right, you'll get a million dollars. You get five right, you'll get 80,000. Four right, we'll get you 16,000. Go to pricepicks.com slash million to check it out. To play, just play it like price picks. Sign up, check in, and pick. Will certain players go over under their certain stats? Will uh, Nikola Jokic have more or less than 28 and a half points, for example? That's the gist of prize picks, but it's for every stat. You pick two to six players. Will they score more or less in their projection? You can up to 25 times your money on any entry. It's not you versus other people. It's just you versus prize picks projection. It's safe. It's easy. And you can get your money back quickly out of the app via your withdrawal. So download the prize picks app or go to pricepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. If you deposit 100 prize picks will give you hundred. If you deposit 50 prize picks will give you 50. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on to for an instant deposit match up to $100 at Price Picks Daily Fantasy made easy. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, Locked On Suns, especially if you're coming from a Pacers fan perspective, because Frank Vogel is the coach in Phoenix. Brendan Clean will have more on his the hire, the assistants coming in, the scope down there with Kevin Young, what that means for the Suns, what his defensive background means. Vogel just keeps getting awesome jobs. Good for him. He did such a good job. With the Pacers, Brendan Clean will have more at Locked On Suns. Coaching carousel almost done spinning in this NBA offseason. Crazy. Only Toronto left. Also, listen to Locked On Raptors. Let's look at the best available players on the point guard market. Pacers can, in theory, sniff out the best available guys at any position. They'll have the cap space to sign most anyone. Not everybody, but most anyone. Uh, but do they even make sense for the Pacers? For example... I use Spotrack's position for these, so I don't duplicate players when I talk about any position list going through this exercise. Thankfully, Spotrack's new uh, system tiers the players from all-star to starter, to rotation to fringe NBA players. So it's very easy to decide who the best players are. Only five starter or better level point guards on the market this summer. If you need a point guard in the NBA, not a good time. That Most teams have one by the way, though. So it's interesting to see where these guys will end up. I predict all of them end up with their past team. But do they make any sense on the Pacers? We'll start at the very top. Kyrie Irving. No. Done. Next. <laughs> Kyrie Irving is good. Uh, he requires the ball. He's not better to me than Tyrese Halliburton. He's not better for the Pacers' identity than Tyrese Halliburton. He is 10 years older almost than Tyrese Halliburton. Even if you think he's more talented right now, by the end of his next deal, he will not be. The Pacers are happy with that, and they don't fit that well together, as you can see with the Kyrie Luka experiment. Really, any team where Kyrie's had to share time with another ball handling guard, it hasn't gone as well as it has for him when he's uh, a little more allowed to, to do things with the ball like he was with LeBron and KD. Just doesn't make sense. The other all star level point guard could be available this summer is Fred Van Vliet, the pride of Rockford, Illinois, which is someone else from Rockford I have to throw in there. Good player, uh, 29, six feet tall. Just not what the Pacers need. Like his shooting is good enough. So is Kyrie's. Like I guess they're both good enough shooters that they would fit off the ball in some capacity if they were willing to do the role. But again, just not a fit with Halliburton really, uh, and, and for what the Pacers need size wise from this position. So while those guys are both really talented and will make their next team better, uh, I don't think they fit what the Pacers need or fit next to Tyrese Halliburton in a meaningfully improved way from anything the Pacers currently have. Like they, they would be better, of course, if they had Kyrie Irving on their team uh, and they got him as a free agent without having to trade anything for him. But how much like the managers missed the playoffs, like how much better are they really going to be <laughs> than, than they were this past season, just from that additional on other stuff would have to happen defensively shooting wise, lots of changes that to make same kind of with Van Vliet, although he is also a pretty good shooter. The other three guys in the starter plus tier, um, one is D'Angelo Russell, who kind of has played off ball in his career before, kind of, but not really. Um, may, I guess maybe you could squint and say that, but I, again, his defense is so terrible that it, he's not better than Halbert, and there's just no reason for the Pacers to pursue him. One of the other starter level guys Spotrack has listed is Russell Westbrook. I don't know if I would put him in the starter category. He was very good for the Clippers, so he deserves it for what he did for that team, I suppose. Uh, again, not a good fit with Halliburton, especially so. Probably the worst of the four players I've said so far. He can't really shoot. He requires the ball to make his plays. He turns the ball over a lot. His defense is was good in the playoffs, so perhaps that could help the Pacers uh, in some way, but the offensive fit is so terrible that it doesn't make sense. And the last one is Patrick Beverly. This one I'll actually stop and talk about for more than two seconds. 
Uh, I don't know what Patrick Beverly's free agency is going to look like because he said, I think on his own podcast, that he wants to make like $15 million a year in free agency. That's just not going to happen. Um, but he can defend. He's very pesky. I've talked about him being a potential Pacers backup target before, before they had uh, a very full point guard rotation. I suppose if he's willing to take like a fourth point guard role on the minimum, yeah, the Pacers would take that. He, he could give them some attitude and some pestiness. And, you know, there's a reason his old nickname was Mr. 94 feet and that teams continue to want him even when he struggles at his prior stop, right? He was great for Minnesota despite kind of whimpering out with the Clippers. He was great for the Bulls despite kind of whimpering out with the Lakers. I, I think the Pacers could, in theory, find a role for him, but it would be very, 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 very small and probably not worth actually investing resources in. So the top end point guards, they don't provide all that stuff that was talked about in the first segment, right? The shooting isn't there. The off ball skills aren't enough there. Again, Kyrie has some of it, I suppose, um, but it's not enough there. It's not combined with defense. It's not combined with size. All these guys are pretty tiny. Beverly plays big, but he's only six one, right? Like it's a small crew. Uh, so th I think that the none of the best of the best make a ton of sense for the Pacers. You could go down a little bit, though. I think there's some other guys who are closer to Westbrook's caliber that aren't in the starter tier. Angelo Russell's a little taller than I thought. He's actually 6'3", but still not quite big enough here. If you go to the rotation tier, all of a sudden there's a bunch of guys, and there's one or two in here that I think are, are actually decent fits for the Pacers. We'll get to them later on, but there's like the best of this group, like Gabe Vincent, who's playing extremely well for the Heat for much of this playoffs. Not amazing, but pretty dang good. Uh, he, he could, like... He's a good player. He'll make sense for a lot of teams. Pacers aren't really one of them. There's a ton of small guys in this group. Javon Carter does a lot of the stuff that Patrick Beverly does. He shoots a lot better, though. He was an awesome shooter last season for the Bucs. He can shoot and defend, right? He's one that I suppose if the Pacers squinted and said, let's try you at the two, you'd be happy with potentially that option for 10 minutes a game. If it came down to it, he wouldn't play over Heald or Matherin or anyone else may be acquired. But, you know, as a guy who shot 42% from deep this past season on on 337 attempts and is a really pesky defender. He was in the Bucks rotation every game. He played all, he played 81, excuse me, not all 82. That's a valuable player, right? Even if he is 27, that's still in a good age range. Like that would be a good ish fit, even if he's only six one, because he can shoot and defend, right? That kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. Even though you consider him a one, that skill set alone would allow him to play the two or a mass Calvert and somewhere else on the defensive end. Obviously, I don't think that's somebody the Pacers should pursue or give significant resources to, but if it just kind of falls towards their lap, sure, that would make some sense. Um, also, in this kind of tier of players, Dennis Smith, who really got his defense looking a lot better last year in Charlotte, has played for Rick Carlisle before, though, and that didn't go so well for his career, but he was really solid on de defense for the Hornets last year. It was a big part of his um, career turnaround. He can't shoot at all, but the defense maybe could be attractive to the Pacers, um, but that's kind of it for the interesting names of this group. Corey Joseph, a former Pacer who's just like a kind of defender and kind of shooter at this stage, but not really awesome at either. I don't think he's a guy that makes sense for the Pacers. There's some young guys that we'll briefly mention in the next segment, but there's not anyone that you'd say, this makes sense. Like the, the other part of looking at free agents is, what role are they going to want? And will the Pacers be able to offer it? And for basically every point guard that won't be able to play wing minutes, the answer is absolutely not, right? They're going to want to play backup minutes or be the fifth guard somewhere so they know they're going to play you know 50 something games during the season pacers can't offer that and because they can't offer the role they're not going to offer the money for the role there's just not really a good fit for a lot of these guys for that exact reason so even if some of them like javon carter for example does fit well after the season he just had he's probably looking for a bigger role maybe i mean he might want a bigger role with the bucks or anywhere but also more money so certainly so maybe a good fit on paper but not financially Let's just get to the realistic fits to me. There could be more than than this to you, or there could be somebody I gloss right over. Maybe you think more highly of the Kyrie Irving Halliburton fit. I don't know, but I have a list really of six guys. It's more so four that are, are really serious that I think if the Pacers signed them, even though they're a one, it would make sense to me. And I would view them as a guy who could theoretically have a role on this Pacers team. One of them, two of them, really. One of them I've talked about for years, and one of them was a very interesting fit given his skill set. Let's close out today's show talking about those players. Welcome back into Locked On Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Check out either Locked On Nuggets or Locked On Heat uh, over behind my laptop screen. I'm recording this. The NBA Finals are going. The third quarter just ended. And the Nuggets are up eight, if that holds. Locked on Nuggets for a 2-0 up team. If it doesn't hold, locked on Heat for a 1-1 series. 
Lots of good shows breaking down the finals. We talked about what the finals means for the Pacers last Thursday, if you're interested in that as well. Let's talk about some realistic point guard targets. Don't roll your eyes. I promise these are interesting. When I was going through this list, immediately two names jumped out at me, and that's almost entirely because of their size, right? And the first one is Delano Banton. Do you know who Delano Banton is, listener? If you do, great. You're going to be like, oh, wow, I didn't even think of that. And if you don't, let me tell you about Delano Banton. He plays and has played for the Toronto Raptors the first two seasons of his career uh, and is six foot nine. <laughs> and that is where I feel like a ton of his value in this comes in. Now, he is a restricted free agent. What it would take for the Pacers to actually pry him from the Raptors, it's probably not worth the the – the RFA dance to them and the Raptors are going to be in a weird offseason anyway. I don't know. I don't want to just guess what's going to happen with him. But if he is available to the Pacers, he can pass it a little bit because of his height. He's not a great passer. Like he doesn't average that many assists per game, but like five per 36 minutes at his height is impressive. He's not a shooter, but he's 6'9 and he's a good finisher. He really upped his scoring rate this past season. His efficiency was better. He got more opportunity when he actually played. And that size just makes him an okay enough defender. His block rate for a guard, 4.5% is bananas, 2.3% steal rate, decent enough assist percentage. Like He's not this really efficient creator. His true shooting percentage, pretty bad. His free throw rate, really bad. He's not an awesome shooter. But at that size and that ability to handle the ball, pretty low turnover rate, only 11.4%. That's a valuable-ish kind of player just because of the size. Like, this is like a, whoa, what do we do with this kind of player? And the Raptors' Project 6-9 deal didn't work out where they had all these ginormous players. But in a better role, I really believe in taller creators. And Ban's not an awesome creator, certainly. Um, but he showed that he has NBA talent. And he's a six foot nine guy who played point guard in college at UMass. Like, I just think this makes sense to me as if the Pacers are going to sign a point guard for some reason. I still don't think this is something they should prioritize unless it's like their absolutely last signing. They don't have the roster spots. They already have point guards. If they draft one, then they definitely don't need a point guard. But if Banton somehow becomes a guy who's available to them, that would make some sense to me just because of the size alone. And like I said, a jumbo creator who can defend, even though that's not a four, right? That's the position Carlisle was talking about when he said that. He said fours, defense, rebounding, guys who can you know, create a little bit. They're so hard to get at that size. Well, Benton is that size. He's not a four. He can't probably guard fours very well, but at that size and creation ability, that would be appealing. I think if you're the Pacers, just to add another guy at that size who can do those sort of things, really unique player. Toronto's really good at turning out these really unique players, but I'd at least sniff around on that. If some of my ABC plans don't go well, for the Pacers. How about another restricted free agent? I'm just going to pick two guys that very little chance to end up on the Pacers because of restricted free agency, but they have size and they can do some of the things I've described. I would soon move over with the Bulls from the Big Ten at U of I. 34% three-point shooter for his career, shot over 50% through two seasons of his career, plays a lot. This isn't like Banton where it's small sample size, right? Good free throw shooting. So unlike Banton, he's more efficient, right? True shooting percentage for his career, 58%. That's very good. He's six foot five. That's very tall for a point guard. He's a decent passer. He's not a great passer. He's a decent passer. I'm being very clear about those words. I wouldn't say he's like throwing guys open, but he can organize an offense. He played point guard for the Bulls on occasion. And again, six five, right? You can play him at the one, two, and sometimes three and be like, yes, this is fine. We're not psyched about this, but this is fine. I wouldn't say his defense is amazing, but it's pretty good, right? He stays in front of guys. He moves his feet well. He's played 2,000 minutes each of the last two seasons. I'd say he's a better defensive player than offensive player. That's the same kind of reasons that Banton makes sense to me is Io making sense to me as a Pacers target. Not because I think he's like the perfect fit or someone they should be chasing the, the day free agency opens, but because if the process continues and he's available to them and he's this kind of Swiss army knife ish, that's such a terrible term to describe players, but Swiss army knife point guard who can help you in many ways, potentially feel more like, yes, he's a point guard air quotes because he can create a little bit, but who can fill other roles kind of like Nembard has these last couple seasons, that would make some sense to me. I typed him down when I passed by him on the list, mostly because of his size. Size was the biggest thing for me when thinking through some of these, do they make sense with the Pacers fit? So both of those guys, Spotrack has in the rotation level section, I agree. Everyone else we're going to talk about is in the fringe section. That's fringe of a rotation, fringe of a roster, whatever you want to say. One of these guys I've talked about, I think this is the third year in a row I brought him up on this exact episode 
and that's Michael Carter Williams, who was a fringe NBA player last year. The Magic signed him very late in the year. He only played in four games the whole season. To me, the argument for him is the same as it is for IO, just worse. <laughs> He's 6'5", and he can guard wings a little bit, right? Like that is exactly why the Pacers would, in theory, want somebody like that. I would say he's a better passer than Io, but he's definitely a worse shooter. He's never been a good three-point shooter. 25% for his career. That's ghastly. There's a reason he's on the fringe of the NBA. He's just kind of always been unique, right? a little before his time with that size, and obviously his career took off in the weirdest way with the stats he was putting up with the 76ers, but you know the efficiency's never really been there. But I, I mean, he's a decent defender, and he's got a lot of length like that's a valuable ish player. I'm so I was surprised he wasn't on a roster at all last year. Um, I, again, not a guy the pitcher should pursue, but if he's like your very last depth guard, I think that would make sense for a team that desperately needs science. And he's a good rebounder for a guard, right? That was something that was impressive about him early in his career. Even with the magic this past season, he had a good rebound rate. So those are the three guys from a size perspective that you're like, oh, they can kind of play the wing. <laughs> that is where the Pacers would, in theory, get more value out of a point guard than other teams is their ability to not play the point guard position, but actually play a different position. That's also why I have Aaron Holiday's basketball reference tab open because he did play on the wing last year. Uh, he wouldn't play. He, he He's too short for it. The Pacers just wouldn't, I don't think, pursue that. But for similar reasons, he would be in this category to me. So. Not a ton of awesome fits. Oh, there's one more. Another ex-Raptor off of two deal. Jeff Doughton, he's 6'4". Uh, he's 26. He's actually been in the league for a couple teams. He played for the Bucks, the Magic, and the Warriors for like heart on hardship deals. Like He's been right on the fringe of the NBA. He's huge, too, um, for his size. But he's really, really raw. But you know he, he's got the size. The defense is interesting enough. But not efficient, not a good shooter. Um, I just wanted to give him a shout because I always liked watching him with the Raptors or the Raptors G League team. So those are the guys that would make sense that aren't on the Pacers right now to me where it's like, okay, if they brought them in on a two-way, on a cheapo deal to be their last guard, whatever, like that would make sense. I don't think it'd be like the best use of the Pacers resources, but I could at least talk about it on this podcast and explain it and talk about why the Pacers did it and how that player would help. There's obviously two other guys that maybe I should have led with, in this segment, here's two point guards that might make sense for the Pacers next season. George Hill and Gabe York, because they were just on the team, right? And George Hill, we went through a whole episode with him and James Johnson about where they could make sense coming back, what the argument is, if they'll both be back, if just one, whatever. Hill is a vet who knows the Pacers organization well. You could never have too much depth at point guard. Like It just kind of makes sense if they're going to have someone filling that sage veteran role that it'd be him. I don't know if he'll be back or not, but... Uh, he is obviously an option just for that alone. Having those vets, of course, was exceedingly valuable for the Pacers this past season. Maybe it would be again. There's a bunch of vets who are out there in theory uh, at that like 35 plus range. Derek Rose, of course, Hill himself, Goran Dragic, uh, DJ Augustine, another former Pacer. But Hill, of course, was with the team last year, has been with the franchise before the longest. Would make sense there. York, maybe on a two-way deal. We did a free agency preview episode for him as well, but you know, giving a standard contract to Gabe York does not seem like a good use of resources for the Pacers, given their current guard depth situation. These final three names, I'll just say, not because I think they make sense from a fit perspective or really you know, any reason, but they're just young and good, and if those players become available, sometimes you just do it. <laughs> Get the young talent figured out later. Deuce McBride, uh, there's no reason for the Knicks to let him go. He's awesome. If he does become free, I love him. Man, would he be <laughs> a fun pickup, good defender, and he's only 22, turns 23 in September. Uh, Trey Jones from the Spurs, also same thing. He's 23. He's pretty talented and young. Again, there's no reason for the Spurs to let him go, but he's good. And Jared Butler, uh, not as good as the first two guys, but I've always been a fan of his game. He's also only 22, just finished a season with the Thunder, had some moments with the Jazz as a rookie. I mean, I guess if he became available, he's more two guard than one guard to me anyway, but if he became available... I mean, why not take a swing at it? He's 2A eligible too, so perhaps that could be appealing. But yeah, he's 6'4". Uh, he had some good moments, like I said. Shot 50% from three this past season. He didn't take very many, to be totally clear. But um, those are three young guys that would make sense just, just from their age alone. But I think Hill, obviously, is the most likely of the names I just said to be, back, to be on the Pacers, back with the Pacers, whatever, next season. But those tall guys I said at the beginning, Carter Williams, Io, and De and um Delano Banton, those would be the ones that I'm like, oh, I get this if the Pacers added a point guard this summer. This, it, let me know if this made sense or if there's somebody I feel like you missed or glossed over or should have talked about more. 
uh, by either tweeting at me at Tony R East or at Locked On Pacers for the podcast account or commenting down below on YouTube. Shooting guards will be later this week with Tyler Smith, and a lot of those will be you know, a similar sort of discussion, right? Can they shoot? Can they defend? But there's less depth there, right? There's some players who can play the two and the one and the three, whatever for the Pacers, but there's a little more that you could be creative with if you're a, a two in the NBA these days. Tomorrow, Jarris Walker time. Really good player for my money. Really good fit with the Pacers. We'll talk about him with our Locked On Cougs host who covers the Houston Cougars. Parker Amesworth should be really fun. Hope you guys enjoyed today's show and had a fan. Fantastic weekend. We will see you tomorrow.